All right, Revelation 3, 17. Uh, I want to say to everybody, I appreciate you showing up to church with clothes on. I do. Um, there was a church, and I'm not making this up. I have it in a PowerPoint somewhere. That I, I talked about this years ago. Um, th that they advertised a sermon series, put billboards all over town in their city where they were from called The Naked Church. And it was one of these sermon series on sex. And it's what these big mega churches or mega church wannabes, it's what they were trying to do to get people's attention in the community. It was, it was, to, it was a shock value type advertisement. There were a lot of churches doing the same thing or a similar thing all over the country. There would be a church that would post a billboard with two set of feet sticking out the end of a bed and um, the billboard would say something like sex in the church question mark and it was basically to shock everybody into noticing that church and they were and they were using the old Madison Avenue premise that sex sells and it was basically using obscenity to get people to come to the church a man by the name of Ed Harris not Ed Harris Ed Ed something junior Ed Ed Harrison Ed something Ed Harris junior I think that was his last name but anyway he was a mega church pastor in Dallas Texas did a did a shock promo where him and his wife got on the flat roof of their church in bed for a week and they stayed in that bed for a week and had cameras on them and they, it was a stunt it was a publicity stunt number one uh, and he's the guy that had a bed on the stage in a sermon series about sex and he said that he said these exact words sex is worship that's what he said because he was making it like your love life and your marriage is a way to worship God it's just totally evil totally blasphemous very lascivious and but it was it was using that shock value to get people in to the church so notice what Jesus sees when he sees the Laodicean church because thou sayest verse 17 I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not thou that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked when Jesus saw that church he saw them naked and naked being naked is a symbol for shame and he says that here that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear in verse 18 he says I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see now uh, take your Bible turn back to Genesis uh, let's see here Genesis chapter 2, this is when, uh, verse 22, the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. 
And notice in verse 25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, how is it that they could both be naked, but not be ashamed? And that is because sin had not been introduced into the world. No sin, no shame. Okay? Now, think about just, we don't like to think of Christ this way, but Christ bore all of our iniquities and our shame to the cross. We don't have paintings in our house of a naked Jesus on the cross, but that is how he was. When they disrobed him, they completely disrobed him. And they made him appear naked on the cross. And what was the point of that? The point of that was he was bearing the shame of our sin. Just as none of us would dare even think of standing in front of the church completely naked, neither would we think of standing in front of the church admitting every sin we ever committed. They're the same. They are, we are ashamed if we're truly born again we are ashamed of what we did. We don't want it brought up ever again. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want anybody else talking about it. It's over and done with. It was a mistake. We can't go back and change it. It's over with. That was, that was the old us. There's a new us now. That's closed. Closed. Amen? That the shame of our naked... He doesn't take away the idea of being clothed. He takes away the, our shame of our nakedness by clothing us. Not by removing shame. The modern church has it backwards. The modern church says... It's okay for you to be the kind of sinner that you are. Nobody has a right to make you ashamed of who you are. That's, that comes out of people like Oprah. Um, what's them gals on the, the view? Whoopi Goldberg. Yeah, that comes out of, that comes out of the, 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 the lesbian mouths. Don't be ashamed of who you are. Don't be ashamed of what you do. Display what you do and who you are in front of everybody and don't let anybody make you ashamed of anything. That is an anti-Christian ideology. That's right. It's trying to remove the shame. People in my grandfather's age that were sodomites didn't go to sodomite parades in Jacksonville, Arkansas in 1941 or 1942 after they bombed Pearl Harbor. They didn't have gay pride parades in Little Rock and Festus, Missouri. They had American War victory parades. Soldiers, new soldiers who were ready to go out into the battlefield would be, be able to march through their hometown and show that we're, give us your support, we're going to fight for America. That's the, that's the kind of people we shouldn't be ashamed of anymore. This is why we fly an American flag, a Christian flag, and a police flag. Because we're not ashamed. Amen? I'm surprised it hasn't gotten us burnt down, shot at. By the way, Melissa, I had a dream last night. I was a new deputy for the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. And on my first day, I arrested four people. And they were the four most wanted people in the whole department. I'm not kidding you. 
And I'm going, I haven't even made it through training yet. That's a true story. That's what I dreamed last night. That was, that was wacky. All right. So they were both naked, man and his wife, and were not ashamed. But now look. Now look. Genesis 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened. Boom. What's the first thing they saw? Their nakedness. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And it was insufficient. God said, I will, I will not. If you, think, if you think I'm going to accept that, you're crazy. I will not accept that. I won't do it. So God himself clothed them. That's the lesson that we learn in Genesis 3 when we first see Adam and Eve and that's the lesson we learn with the very last church that he mentions now the reason why I wanted this up on the screen is I want you to look up on the screen for a second the word church is mentioned 77 times in the Bible King James Bible and the 77th verse of the King James Bible is Genesis 3:21. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. That's the 77th verse of the King James Bible. The 77th occurrence of the word church is the church of the Laodiceans. And that's the church where Jesus counsels them that they may be clothed that the shame of their nakedness doth not appear. This Bible is in order. Amen? Isn't that neat? 77th verse matches the 77th occurrence of the word church in the King James Bible. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Now, turn to 2 Corinthians 5. Let's get a little doctrine in here. In our Sunday school class, you get cookies. Juice, chocolate, milk, and steak. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, and now think about this for a second. Our soul is a body inside of us. It also is naked, but it's clothed upon with this body. Does that make sense to everybody? This body, just like, just like the uh, shell of a sunflower seed, is covering the sunflower seed. So when we put a sunflower seed in our mouth, David, what do we do with the shell? Suck the salt off of it, and when we're done, crack it, spit it out, and eat the seed. Okay? Our soul also is our true body. It is the truest part of who we are. It is clothed upon with our flesh, that outer shell. So he says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, this earthly body, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now think about the two, a fig leaf and a leather coat, a coat of skin, which is what God made for Adam and Eve, which would last longer, the fig leaf or the leather coat, leather coat, okay, the fig leaf would only last it was a temporary fix, wasn't it? That's what the law was. That's what the whole Old Testament law was. A temporary patch on an eternal problem. So God took away the temporary patch and he put on it 
the everlasting seal so that now once we are forgiven we are forgiven once and for all the Bible says amen it's the difference between wearing leaves for clothes which would be really uncomfortable do what yeah, especially if you get the wrong leaves. Leaves of three, leave them be. So he says, verse 2, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. That's the one Bonnie just got. She doesn't groan anymore. I'd, I would be in the room with her. And she would shift in her bed and you would hear her just wail and groan in pain. She don't do that anymore. She has an everlasting fix for her problem. Amen, Roy? Amen. Amen. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. See, we don't want to be stripped bare and enjoy it we want to be clothed God put it in our nature for we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened not for that we would be unclothed oh no not that we would be naked but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life now we have eternal life. Somebody say amen. And I've, I've made this analogy. To me, it makes all the sense in the world. There is, there is a, it's sort of an, it's an unspoken doctrine, but it's a doctrine nonetheless in the scriptures about children and do babies and toddlers and youngsters, if they die, do they go to heaven? Or are they held accountable because they're born in flesh? And we have two examples in the scriptures. One is David's first son from Bathsheba. David explicitly said I shall go to him but he shall not come to me when in other words when the baby died David got up shaved dressed himself bathed himself went sat down and eat and his servants inquired of him saying while the baby was sick you did not eat anything you didn't get up you didn't bathe you didn't shower you didn't do anything now that the baby's died, shouldn't you be mourning? And David said, no, because I know where he is. And I know that where he is, I will go. I'll be with him. Trust me, that helps. Trust me, that helps. And then we have, I think it's in Numbers 14. The curse that God laid upon the Israelites for listening to the ten spies who said, we cannot go into Canaan. The curse that God laid upon the Israelites on those who were to wander 40 years in the wilderness and could not go into the promised land was specifically to those, and God said it this way, who knew the difference between good and evil. That same phrase, good and evil, comes from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So those in the wilderness who were born in the wilderness, not in Egypt, who were born in the wilderness, who had no knowledge between good and evil, they were allowed to go into the promised land. Generally, they would have been about a year old. 
because they had wandered about a year in the wilderness. Or possibly those that were maybe a year old as they left Egypt. But the bottom line is, God knew every child among the Israelites who at the time of the rejection of Joshua and Caleb saying, let's go into the promised land. At that time, God knew who among the children of Israel could go in and who had to die in the wilderness. Because he knew on that day which ones knew the difference between good and evil. Now, what age is that? That's the big theological question. What age is that? Is it three? Is it four? Is it five? Is it six? Is it seven? Some say, well, my daughter got saved at six. Some would say, well, that's too young. They don't know. Here's what I believe since bell ring. I think it's the day when they realize that they're naked. When they step out of the bath. See, a child, it's like um, Elena, Courtney's youngest daughter. When it's time to change her diaper, she can run all over, she can run all over town, run all over Walmart, show her little fanny everywhere she wants. And everybody goes, oh, that's so cute. And she doesn't think anything of it. She has not reached an age where she understands that she's naked. But there will come a time when she will not want to be taking her clothes off in front of daddy and brother and uncle so-and-so and all the neighbors and, Mom! Mom, don't do that! Don't show that picture, Mom! Why? Because I was naked. There comes a time when every child gets to a point to where they don't go running around naked anymore. And at that point, I believe that they're at the point where they can understand between good and evil because now they have the shame of nakedness. Does that make sense theologically? I think it does. I think it works. So that's the doctrine there. We're not looking to be unclothed now that we're saved. We're looking to be clothed upon with better clothing. Amen? Father, bless your word. Thank you for it. Thank you, God, for taking away the shame and reproach that we brought on ourselves. God, I never want to think of the past. I never want to go back there. Jesus Christ, thank you for bearing my shame and my reproach. Thank you for lifting that off of me and for putting it on yourself. Father, forgive us all. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and clothing us the way you have so that we no longer have to be ashamed ever again. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.